And hello, welcome to Friday night's after show on Narrative TV. It's good to be with you tonight with Greg Oliar, our regular here. How are you doing, Greg? I am well, Zev. How are you? I'm good. It's good to be back with you. And a very special guest tonight, Michael Edison Hayden from the Southern Poverty Law Center, who's written this incredible piece, which you've seen it, Greg, about Twitter and about the connections between Jack Dorsey and a, a few right-wing extremist people, like really extremist people. And so we'll go through some of that tonight with uh, Michael. But I want to say good night, uh, good evening to you, Michael, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, sir. Appreciate it. So tell me a little bit about the genesis of this piece. And I think you were describing it before we got on the air as a story no one else wanted to write. Well, the way I described it was it's like if you have to clean out a bunch of junk in the garage and like every week is going by and it's like sometimes years go by, right? And you just don't, nobody wants to do it. That's the way I viewed writing this, which is, this is something that's just like sitting on my head for five years, just thinking about what's happened to Twitter or what Twitter has enabled and why. And I'm just like, this is going to be annoying. This is going to be some really annoying work because we all know that Jack Dorsey follows Mike Cernovich and he followed him while he was pu publishing disinformation about a number of subjects. And then why hasn't that really been reported out? Or if it has been reported out, I mean, most of it is like people tweeting about it, right? Just people tweeting angrily about how the site is allowing far right extremists and allowing disinformation to happen. And I also felt that Twitter has gotten off very easy. I don't want to say anything too nice about Facebook, but they've taken a big hit since 2018 or so. I just remember in 2018, things started to really get tough for uh, Facebook. People people became more and more critical of Facebook. People, there were more stories, like every kind of uh, digital publication, BuzzFeed type publication started to hit Facebook with these stories. And you just Twitter would just exist. And it's partly, I think, just not, not to go too long on this one thing, but I, I think there's also people, journalists get their their bread from Twitter. This is like they need. We need this website to like for content to pe get people to reach people and things like that. People are, I think, it's really scared to. For, I mean, it's full time job for me, and without Twitter, I'd have no job, right? So and it's a. It, it's really important in terms of. Yeah. of I'm a spokesperson now, and yeah, I'm a spokesperson now, and sometimes I have to speak. And how else are you going to reach people? It's right. really difficult. So I think that combination of things made me want to put it off for a long time. But that after, after the insurrection, I really did. I felt like I just it just had to be done, and it had to be done thoroughly. And I'm not done yet. I mean, there's a lot more to write about what Twitter has done specifically to journalism that we didn't get into here, and just how it has really warped in, in the guise of like both sides were representing both sides. What is really done to warp the conversation around journalism? And right. there se seems to be to to me an agenda behind it, whether it's you know, like a, a really calculated thing on the part of Twitter's executives or just a simple way of just knowing that this is a way to make money. It's so powerful, right? When they took Donald Trump off Twitter, it changed the entire dynamic for the, for the political discourse in, in America. That one move was so important. So it certainly uh, lends credence to your argument here that something needs to be done in order to contain what is this increasing division that uh, Twitter has given America. Uh, there was big news today, though. Nick Fuentes, I think is how you say his name, who became a superstar in right-wing circles after Charlottesville. He was finally taken off Twitter today. He was suspended. Tell us a little bit about how long he's been on Twitter and why this is so significant. So the, the, the Fuentes just floated around the ether up until Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And Twitter verified his account in the immediate aftermath of that. And really? yeah, he had no discernible credentials outside of hosting a YouTube show in which he voiced many like white supremacist talking points and eventually espousing uh, views that were overtly fascist, praising Mussolini, talking about wanting to give a Roman salute, also known as a Hitler salute to Trump. Mm. So he didn't really have much to make him a, a person to listen to at the time that they verified him, but it really built up his celebrity, enabled him to build this whole America First Pack movement, this America First movement, which really, I think at its core, the irony is it really undermine, doesn't seek to undermine America, it turns turn America into something that serves only the people who believe in that cult. It really does further America's decline, things like America First Pact. And you have people like Paul Gosar, who is one of the most extreme politicians in America, going to speak at, at, that, at that pact. You can say 
with confidence that almost none of that would have happened without Twitter. And he says it himself. He says he got suspended from YouTube. He got suspended from from D Live even after we reported on D Live, which is you know filled with white nationalist content. And, and Fuentes himself said, "Hey, we were able to retain 80 percent of our viewership to our stream because we could just say to people, hey, check me out on Twitter." Right. So they build their audiences out of these big stunts like Stop the Steal or the events at Charlottesville. They gain that traction and then they become really important mouthpieces for these movements on the back of Twitter. And Jack Dorsey has verified or Twitter verified this guy way back in 2017. Yeah. We don't know if he did it or wh- wh- whoever did it, but whatever it is. Jack Dorsey should be aware of who Nick Fuentes is at this point. If you are a person who can read and has read a newspaper, you have an idea of it that some people did something at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, and you can go from there and find out how many people of those people were celebrities that became celebrities almost exclusively because of Twitter. So this is not a point that should escape Jack Dorsey. He should know that who he is and that he's on the platform. Absolutely. Greg, have you ever spoken to Jack Dorsey? No. No. Michael, I, have you I, ever spoken I, to Jack Dorsey? No, he doesn't. He, he doesn't oh, he talk to me if I reach out about Bitcoin or something. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's something but, he would talk about. But uh, two people that have spoken to him, one is Ali Alexander, of all people. They became really good friends. And yeah, According to Alexander. Yeah. Yes. Take that Dorsey just says he makes interesting points, but he's never denied it. Let's, I'm just, yeah. just for they the fact. out together. Clearly, they talk to each other. Ali Alexander is on the very fringe of Republican politics here, and he is as far as you can go, right? And why is Jack Dorsey even associating it with this guy? It must be an endless number of reasons why this is bad optics for him. I think that Alexander is the type of guy who can effectively get in people's ears. He is absolutely dangerous, as proven by the, what happened with the Stop the Steal movement. He repeatedly used Twitter to uh, publish disinformation, including disinformation that's connected to foreign intelligence. We're talking about the, he was, he supported Macron leaks, for example, right. along with Jack Pacific, when he's a much smaller thing. He is an effective communicator in some ways. It's hard to imagine that from our perspective, but he's effective at listening to people who want to hear why things that could make them rich and powerful are good. And you could imagine somebody like Dorsey, who is profiting so much off of extremism and chaos or that somebody who is smooth talking or the very thing that is destroying our culture, justifying it to him. You can imagine why some of that stuff might land well with somebody like Dorsey who wants to keep that profit flowing. So you think this is all about profit for, for Dorsey? This is he's basically profiting of chaos. He's just an agent of chaos and therefore just making money off it. That's what he- we can say with certainty that he's worth over $10 billion, which yeah. is over $10 billion more than I have. Now, <laughs> the, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's only acting out of a profit mode. Right. Um, I think there's probably some triage here where the profit is going to come first, and that means that they're willing to, he's willing to go against whatever ideology he might have in order to keep that profit going. So it's just that's why you, sometimes Twitter can be shamed into taking some sort of action. But from the sources with whom I've spoke, they, he's a libertarian who operates under a libertarian worldview, and that worldview enables him to see people like Mike Cernovich or something like that and in in a sort of a positive free speech argument well he's making interesting points that's one of the well, that's what he said about Ali Alexander is making interesting points right we need to be open minded to all kinds of speech and stuff like that which is absolutely true this were some sort of perfect scenario in which um, social media was like a place where everybody could talk and it's very complicated it's not about freedom of speech it's about freedom of reach how many people you can reach at one time and there is a reason why you can't show hard, hardcore pornography on ABC at 10 o'clock at night. There's a reason why we don't do certain things. And the reach of this disinformation that's been shown, we've seen the after effects of it. We've seen what it does. Twitter is not a neutral platform for speech uh, where everyone gets a shot to say their point. It is a place that can be easily hijacked to harm. And that's what's been happening for a very long time. What's up with the way he appears? I'm not questioning it, but really, what is going on with... 
the long beards. And I know because he's a he goes to Myanmar and meditates and does a lot of reading. But the appearance is quite striking. It's not your typical. It's a little different. But I shouldn't be. It looks like a basis for like a doom metal band or something yeah, like that. He, he comes like, um, which, guy. I, I was going to say he's the star of a B movie knockoff of the Lord of the Rings trilogy or something. Right, he does look like that. Thou like shalt not pass. <laughs> yeah, in Game of Thrones, wasn't there a character that looked like this as well? In, in Game of Thrones. I think that, first of all, the article is, is really excellent, and there's a lot in there to think about. And what you said about it being complicated is true. I think that he is, to some degree, one of these guys, which there are many of them in the tech world, dudes, white dudes who are like, no, we should be able to say whatever we want. And that's just their thing. They They do this libertarianism thing. Because for whatever reason, as brilliant as they are with tech, their social consciousness has not evolved past 10th grade, which is about when you should realize that all of the Ayn Rand shit is just YA garbage. But I think the problem, as I see it on Twitter, with the it speaks to what you said about reach and not applying the rules fairly across the board. Like if you're watching a basketball game and an NBA game, and the refs are giving your team or calling fouls on your team and not the other team, you get pissed off because you say, I don't care how the game is called. I want it to be called fairly. And I don't feel like that's really what's going on there to some degree. Like I'll give you an, I'm just speaking anecdotally here. It seems like in my bubble of anti-Trump and Trump Russia Twitter, a lot of the a lot of the people that were banned got banned because they went after two people in particular, Tommy Lavra, whatever her name is, and Ann Coulter. Say anything remotely bad about those two, and you were banned. Mm. But people could come Tommy in and Larry. say horrible. Yeah, her. Some people could come in and say the same things or horribly rotten things about other people, and they were fine. It was almost like those two people in particular. It was just hands off. And to the degree that you started to wonder me as an impartial observer, what's going on here? Are they like on some list that they're being protected? I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying it felt that way. And it's the same thing with the verification. A lot of a lot is made about who gets verified and who doesn't get verified. And I'm verified and it's great to be verified. It really is. It has perquisites that you unverified people zev can only know, dream of i know yeah and i do dream of it um and i, I may <laughs> dream of it for a very long time i don't think it's going to take my in badge. The future <laughs> <laughs> so but it's there's a utility to it but ultimately all it's supposed to do is confirm that you are who you say you are it's not supposed to be you're famous or you're a celebrity or you're this or you're that it's supposed to be as i understand it this person is verified to be who they say they are which in my view means many more people should be verified than are currently. What's the happened verification though- rule. Just to clarify, they, they did put out a new verification policy this year, which does seem to attach a, an importance to the verification based on status or experience or working for an important organization or what have you. Um, which is fine, yeah. but I don't know. I, I just feel like then they're, again, they're changing the rules midstream. Right. If you're going to verify these little white nationalist pricks and not you and not Noel Kassler mm -hmm. and not AG and these other people who have big media also have big media platforms, by the way, mm -hmm. narrative yeah. is not a, it's not nothing. No nope. Mueller. She wrote in, in daily beans, ain't nothing. It's Why crazy. is she not verified? And this, this little fucking asshole is verified. Yeah. Nick, who, whatever his name is. It's ridiculous. Well, I, and that, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. It's not being applied evenly across the board, which should fly in the face of his libertarian principles, damn it. I, I will just tell you what I, what I know about some uh, people, people who have applied for verification. Some of the researchers with whom we work at SPLC, Megan Squire is one, for instance, who's one of the best, I think, disinfo folks out there. She got her verification restricted. And you have to wonder, it's like, oh, okay, we, do we, maybe we don't want to attract more attention to people who are making us look bad. That is uh, always a concern that they're, they don't want that. But I, I think that it's much more than like, oh, we're willing to verify this person and not willing to do that. They are taking people who have no credentials at all right, uh, right. in a media sense and making them into people. Like they're, It's like creating... Yeah. characters for the platform and that is that is where it does feel activist to me right you yeah. take somebody like jack kozobik who okay let's just quickly run down because because he's somebody i know more probably than almost any extremist in the that, that i cover jack kozobik used to run a game of thrones twitter account mm -hmm. 
uh, called Angry Game of Thrones fan. And he used to put post this kind of race baiting, ra- uh, racist material. Like when there, there was a new Star Wars movie coming out, he would the the Angry Game of Thrones fan was, was highlighting the degree to which Star Wars was using more people of color in a, in a negative way. And we saw like Chuck Johnson, who I'm sure you guys uh, are well familiar with the material you cover. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Johnson's uh, Got News. I don't know whether Pozovic was in contact with him at that time or not. He became close with him later, certainly. He would publish from the Angry Game of Thrones. He embedded some of uh, his tweets into Got News things and appeared alongside Roger Stone at the Republican uh, National uh, Convention in Cleveland. I followed him to a book store appearance, started uh, allegedly approached Richard Spencer and described himself as uh, you know, saying, I mean, I like what you do. We like what you do. This, this screenshot is uh, January, 2017. He was verified after this. You know, we like, we, Roger and I like what you do. You're Roger. St- I, I'm Roger Stone's man. Mm. Right. And then he went to, went on to lead a number of big disinformation campaigns, which have, which are really saturated with foreign influence. I mean, Pizzagate is one of them. Another one is, of course, the Macron leak saga. Mm-hmm. These are all things that were done on Twitter and whatever. Also, and um, Arizona recount, that's whole thing is yeah. part of his world. Oh, that is literally all he does. Mm-hmm. And this is a long way of saying that this posed as, you know, what I don't know what, we're, how, how else are we supposed to interpret from our CBS News on this bio that you're showing here? Oh, yeah. You know, this, say what I'm... Is that? I was like, uh, what, what is that? Yeah, I, this, I this, work there. The I don't subte- follow him they'd be working there. Yeah, the subtext is that I'm a former uh, CBS News journalist. I don't know what anyone else would think about it, but he never worked for CBS News. I, co- I contacted them. Wow. Um, I contacted local affiliates in in Pennsylvania and in D.C. They said that, no, he's never worked for us. These are places where... So he was a reserve naval intelligence officer. He didn't have a lot, ton of time to work for CBS. What, what is all this? Where did this come from? So he doesn't um, work for CBS News, does get verified. I used, yeah. used to work for CBS News for real. Don't get verified. That's annoying. No, now, yeah, you should try putting firmer CBS News in your exactly like <laughs> that. It's in the first line. But what's, what, what I find scary about, about the, the, the way Pozovic became a god is that, that he had uh, no credentials, nothing to show other than these disinformation campaigns. He worked for one month for Rebel TV, which in itself is like, why would that be verified in its own right? It is a, an extreme far right racist channel with tons of racist comment and content. So he worked for a month there while he did Macron leaks. And there's really nothing else other than doing Pizzagate, the Melania stuff, the Rape Melania, if you recall that, that, that thing that he did. He, he did a lot of these fake Antifa things where he was blaming Antifa for different violent incidents. So he was just conjuring up that um spectrum and, and he really so had nothing else right for the right wing basically he does everything uh, so. yes and 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 so dorsey and his company would have ample evidence that mm. jack pozovic is really nothing but a disinfo operative right. he called right. himself a political operative right and we know he publishes disinformation so he's really a for hire disinfo guy and they verify him and he goes on to get over a million followers. And then what, what is he doing with the over a million followers? He's doing the Hunter Biden op. He's doing Stop the Steal. He eventually got a, a, a gig with One American News despite being, not being a journalist. Not that they do journalism, but it's you know, they actually so led in, but they put him on TV. And like, I, I don't consider myself a very lively TV anchor type guy, but like you should see Pacific. I mean, he's, he, he seems like he's had a lobotomy or something when he's talking to, to it. And this is really all Twitter. Twitter made this guy a thing. It's like creating like a, a some kind of sock puppet from scratch. He is just a guy who posts disinformation. Oh, so it makes you highly suspicious about how the platform operates. It certainly makes me suspicious. Well, because the... Well, you, what about, oh, Go ahead. the followers, the million followers, presumably many of those million followers are not real. And I think this is another problem is that people get onto these things, they're perceived in a certain way, and suddenly you look and they have half a million followers and somebody stumbling in sees the badge and all those followers and thinks, oh, okay, this must be somebody... This must be somebody, which, as you really, point out, he's not. He, he's a schmo. It, 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 the, it, the Twitter re- leans heavily on appearances. It leans very heavily on appearances, which is why it is all so, so toxic for journalism, because journalism is all about getting into the ugly stuff. 
Mm-hmm. It's about a, it's not necessarily the uh, always the the nicest profession. We we have to do some dirty work um, and we find some dirty things and etc. And it's it, it, and the material has to be detailed. There's got to be a lot of it. And when you get when you translate it to a platform that deals almost completely in surfaces with like how many likes, how many retweets, what does it look like, what does the headline say? It has it it atrophies on the the profession as a whole. And no better example than the fact that people like Pozobic and Cernovich, who are best known for posting disinformation that led to horrific harassment campaigns of innocent people, like in the case of Pizzagate, are treated as journalists. These people are treated on the, by people who are angry and are into the Trump thing as journalists, like they're, they're providing information when in reality they are providing just uh, gasoline to a fire. Right. It's so interesting. I've argued for a long time. We're in the middle of a disinformation war, a civil war, but it's or maybe it's a global and a civil war at the same time. But it's a disinformation war. So the means with which you get information out is the way to stop that war. If you stop Fox News, you stop Newsmax, you stop Twitter, you stop Facebook, that's how that war ends, because there's no way to get that information, mostly from outside sources to the American public. And it strikes me that what you're talking about here is that Twitter is really leaning into one side of this information war. And that is incredibly troubling because that that side happens to represent a lot of foreign adversaries as well as many domestic terrorists. Yeah, last time I was on here, it was me and Luke O'Brien and we uh, talked a lot about the capital violence. And I can't remember if we got into this or not, but a really big detail for me is the fact that Stop the Steal as a hashtag, the first people to ever launch that hashtag did so in 2016. Right. This is a long Mm -hmm. thing. And consider that the premise of it, right, is to undermine the, was basically the validity of a a democratic election. Mm -hmm. That is the whole point. If you lose, Stop the Steal is there to lean on. Now, we didn't see what could have happened with it because right. Trump uh, became president. Right. But Roger Stone first brought it out at a time when actually, what, really interesting detail about it, could have been stolen from him because, or stolen from Trump because uh, it was actually to stop the RNC, believe it or not, from trying to dump Trump at the convention. Right. right, because there was a lot of pressure from them to do it. So maybe there was some actual legitimacy stop to steal the hashtag that they could have tried to swap out somebody who they felt they had be- better control over at that time. But the they planned it. It. clearly it's something that they planned. I got to fill in a break. Um, let's do that, yeah, and then we'll ahead. come back and talk about some other things on the other side of this. These are called blue blocks, and they are great because. One of the things that they do is they block out different shades of light. I stare at my computer screen for hours every day. And I've really noticed that, actually, I noticed a couple of things about staring at the computer for hours every day. One thing I notice is that I get a lot more typos the longer I stare at the screen. And then sometimes my eyes get really blurry. Sometimes I get headaches. It's just a lot of eye strain when you're staring at a monitor for you know hours and hours every day. So blue blocks uses color filtered lenses to heal a variety of complaints in people's lives. Now, these are called the blue light computer glasses. They're clear lenses and they help with headaches, sore eyes, digital eye strain. Now, there's four of these different kinds of, of blue block sunglasses. There is the summer glow that helps you with the low mood and migraines and improving your sleep. And then the other one is the blue light I told you about. So I have a sunglass range as well. So blue block ships worldwide in rapid time. They have easy returns and exchanges. And you can go to blueblocks.com slash narrative and use the coupon code narrative to save 15%. That's blueblocks.com B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash narrative and use coupon code narrative, N-A-R-A-T-I-V, to save 15%. You look good in those blue blocks, Ev. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, very nice glasses. You should really, if, if you're interested in glasses that block blue light, then these are the ones to go for because they're made by real optical opticians and not by mass-produced warehouses in, in Asia. So let's get back to Twitter. What do you think is, was the thing with Fuentes today, do you think that was a response to your article? It seems like that's the buzz on the internet. I mean, that your piece came out this week. There's another piece by the ADL this week, but that two days later, Fuentes is gone from Twitter. Zeus with the thunderbolt. 
Yeah, that's what it is. No, I think it's not surprising that he was he's he personally blamed ADL, and I think yeah. he did that largely to feed into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. But I think he, ADL you know, it enables him to you know, talk about these conspiracy theories that neo Nazis believe about Jewish control of the the country and things like that. I, I personally do think it was uh, in response to that, but it's also a response to reporting that we have done consistently on Fuentes for going back months now. We did, were reporting on him and what he was doing on DLive before and reaching out to Twitter then. What bothers me about it is that it took this much because they shouldn't be embarrassed and have to have their hands forced or something like that. Perhaps the pitch of outrage was so high about Fuentes that they just had to do it. And and something like Jack Pozobic is not uh, at the moment. Twitter gets away with this stuff when they feel that they can and they don't have to do the right thing. They're not going to do the right thing. As I mentioned to you when we were off, Twitter verified Stephen Miller before he ever tweeted anything. Again, Mm -hmm. he was- That's really shady. That's really shady. He was in the White House and Twitter chose to give him a verified handle before he ever tweeted anything. Mm. You can say, oh, of course he's verified. He's very famous. He's like the head of the Republican Party now, basically, in so many ways. He's like on T on Fox all the time. He's one of the most influential figures in, in the Republican Party. It, it really gives you a step up, presumably. I haven't seen the quantification of this, but it must be that a lot more people who are verified get followed than people who don't. You can certainly say that Stephen Miller is a famous person, so therefore he whatever. But again, they have these policies against hate and, and so forth. And I don't think there's any you know more immediate symbol of hate than Stephen Miller because of what he believes about non-white people, what he believes about Muslims, what he believes about people from Latin America. He admires policies that are immigration policies that are based on eugenics. This is is the the exact type of person that we as a society should be saying, like, this is not, this is not someone we want to promote on our thing. But yet in his uh, redemption tour that has been going on the right here, where he's on Fox, like basically every night, he's basically a Fox talking head. He's talking in CPAC. That verified handle helps. It helps to say like, this guy's okay. These views, maybe they don't care like what a Muslim person feels about that. But he really genuinely believes that people from the developing world are are less than human based upon his emails, based upon uh, everything we have seen from him. Yeah. It's really uh, the approach that they've taken with Fuentes and Miller is really interesting in, in light of, of other people they've, they've also banned or suspended, like Laura Luma. On the one hand, they do this action. They do like a, a small action. They take someone like, like Fuentes off. But then Dorsey will appear in the Rolling Stone magazine praising Laura Luma for her protest. She said that, I love that she came to, she locked herself or chained herself to the Twitter doors because she was banned, from, by, banned by Twitter. And she says, and he said, I love the protest. I'm, I'm a punk. My music when I was growing up was punk. Hackers are punk. It's questioning the system, man. Not because you hate it, but because you want to make it better. You know, it, what is this that's, guy like again is he like 15 fucking years old like grow the fuck up man yeah but it's also like punk is for children it's not for action. adolescents it's not for grown men no. sorry it's true he seems very I, 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 I just want to say I don't fully endorse that comment Greg but um, but uh... <laughs> you know what I mean the ethos the idea the idea that that yeah. ethos should like trump everything is right insane sure you know, well, it, it that yes. ethos should like trump everything is right. insane. It's so it's that, anarchic, that, that, is what okay. it is. And sure, I the, think our punk rock should mature, or the way the degree to which we are punk rock must mature along. <laughs> with. Those of us who grew up on Billy Joel and Simon and Garfunkel don't have these kinds of problems. So I'm saying, so I'm saying. So <laughs> as, a, as a person um, who grew up in Long Island, I also appreciate. So, and this is the I don't know much about all this tech stuff, so I'm going to say right now, shout out Brett Pettacord, who's watching. My understanding is this is not a Twitter specific problem, although as Michael has pointed out. Twitter, I'm echoing Zev all the time. I know, it's because of yeah. my earphones. Yeah, I don't know why. Should be fine. Now I can't hear you. We lost. I can't hear him. I lost you. Now we can't hear you. I can hear you, Michael, but I can't okay. hear Greg. I don't know what happened. I didn't touch anything. Um, sorry, Greg, you're going to oh. have to join us again. You're going to have to log off and log on. You could still hear us. Or maybe your microphone is not on. Uh, what, what I was going to say in reference to that, like the sort of the punk rock ethos yeah. thing and all that, you know, 
what the far right does can appeal to your most, you know, to the people who are mo- most, who have the most primitive interpretation of what punk rock is, right? Which is why people, you'll see like the, the, the InfoWars guy, I forgot his name now, Prison Planet, Prison Paul, Paul Watson. He, he, he likes to frame it as like, oh, conservatism is punk rock, even though this is, what are they conserving? This is just racism. Yeah, I mean, you can see it because you understand to, to whatever degree that like, that there is a, a liberal majority in the country. We've you go to your supermarket and there's they're selling pride flags and stuff like that now. And somewhere places in the Northeast during in June, there are the the country is changing. The culture is changing in the United States in some ways, and you will absolutely get that conflict when you do the opposite of of these things. When you are reactionary and coming into conflict with that culture. If you're not a sophisticated person or a sophisticated thinker, you can easily confuse that, I think, with punk rock, like necessary punk rock. The reality of it is, though, that you are doing things on in the interest of those with a lot of money, a lot of power. White supremacy support billionaires, mm-hmm. right? It supports people who have a ton of money. That's why $4.5 million went to VDARE in 2019, a white nationalist or nonprofit in the run-up to the election. This, the, these things serve the interests of, of the Mercers. They serve the interests against the Constitution of, in, some re, in some ways. Of course. I mean, you get to the point where these guys are running an, an illegal thing. It's, no, you know, it's non-democratic. No, I just, my last slide is that white nationalists who act like they are up against the system or whatever are really only serving the interests of, of the elites, the type of people who don't want us to come together on climate change, mm-hmm. things like that. This benefits people who are very rich and would rather us talking about culture war things rather than solving these problems like a lake inside of a subway station. I just want to say I agree with everything Jack Dorsey says. Jack Dorsey is God. Twitter is wonderful. Thank you and good night. (laughs)